the times I've been I'll start accepting from it now. American okay. Review. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. That makes me feel real good. I, will, I didn't mean to reject your... your, your, your I don't think it was you. Okay. All right. Oh, man. That made me cry over here, Lewis. Cry. <laughs> we'll see. See if it happens. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Tony. Or Anthony, I, uh, I'm confused, I go by both. But let's just say Tony. Um, grew up here in Ann Arbor, went to Pioneer High School. Um, anybody? Anybody at Pioneer? Get the theater there. That's, no, it's okay. Um, oh man, I grew up, uh, I fell in love with poetry in the Ann Arbor Youth Poetry community um, via Jeff Cass and all the cool people I grew up with in that community, such as Fiona and um, a, who else in here? Lewis was a part of that. Um, lots of other people. And uh, I don't know. So I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've been wanting to be at sort of like a, this this kind of reading for a while because it just homecoming. makes me feel, yeah, it makes me feel like it's a homecoming because I was away in Ohio for a couple of years. Um, anyway, so I'll start off with, uh, speaking of being away for a couple of years in grad school, um, I was at Bowling Green State University, got my MFA there in poetry. And uh, I loved it there. Um, now I'm back uh, getting my teaching certification so I can teach high school English. Um, but speaking of grad school, if I can find this poem, there's a poem. Uh, aha! Okay. Poem that's going to talk about me in grad school in some ways. Um, okay. Okay, this is called, I also was. Um, for a while in undergrad and after undergrad, while I was waiting to hear back from colleges for a long time, I was a custodian. Um, and so I worked at my dad's, it was over there, hey dad! And then oh, right yeah. next to her, my mom, hi mom, love you both! Um, um, I worked at my, I was the janitor at my dad's work, so it worked out nicely. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll start this, it's called Tired Grad Student uh, Looks Back at His Custodian Past. <coughs> <clears throat> Wiping down crumb-blasted counters, washing out oatmeal-y sinks with blue concentrated soap, scrubbing disaster zone toilets in the men's room, replacing the toilet paper for the 30,000th time. And then there were the things that really sucked, like picking up a dead duck armored with maggots and bagging it up and tossing it into the dumpster, or every time the alarm went off and I'd have to run and disarm it as if I were some kind of pudgy James Bond stuck in a movie about a man who graduated a year ago and lives at home with his folks and his cat, which sometimes displays its incontinence on his favorite t-shirts. <laughs> but would it be so bad to say I missed it all? What about the things that made me smile, like finding chocolate wrappers in the little metal bins in the women's room, or the times I opened the dumpster up to find obese raccoons bailing out of the bin? like greasy stray popcorn kernels from the bag? And what about the secretary who lambasted every school that rejected me, all 26, and the way she bought me a journal and pens when I finally got in somewhere? And even all the messes fade away into a narrative that goes something like this. Antsy man-boy student of English finds a job that pays for his tuition and gives him a place to put his hands while the accusatory hours of evening slowly fade around him. How's the sound? Good. Is it, is it good? Okay. Any not good? It's Velvety and Mellifluous. Okay. <laughs> Mellifluous is really the perfect word. Mellifluous. Dulcet. Dulcet. I like that word. Dulcet. Dulcet. Um, okay. This poem's called Nothing. I think it's av available on one of those broadsides there. Also, you can look at it for free online because uh, it's one of the few poems I have published. Literary orphans. Terrible salesmanship, man. Uh, what? <laughs> Terrible salesmanship. Yeah, <laughs> one of the few poems I have published. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm buy sorry. this poem that you can have for free online. Well, well, but, no, but, but if you buy it, if you buy this these here, um, then you will be donating to uh, Jewish Family Services. Um, specifically to help um, place and support refugees in the area, this Washtenaw area. So um, that's a good thing. There's the <laughs> angle. And there, are two, there are two poems on that. 
It's on a piece of paper, so you can keep it with, with the you. best font in the world, Bell MT. Simon works magic um, on those, so thank you, Simon. All right, this uh, okay. So this one's called Nothing. It's sort of a philosophical meditation on just the concept of nothing and the concept of maybe something uh, just perhaps sinister with that. <clears throat> nothing. It'd take out all your teeth and give them back as several sets of cufflinks and studs. Slip into your body as office white noise, but drenched in kerosene. Sand off your fingerprints and sell them at a dollar store. Dye your irises white and fill them in with Easter egg sketches. Its profound plainness would feign its own disappearance, and you would believe it had left, but the little men and women in your memories would see it, and they would pack their tiny suitcases one by one. As you can see, I'm not good at memorizing poems. Um, so I, should, I got this big stack of poems. I don't even know I'm reading here. I'm doing my best. Okay, this next one is going to be about a creature, a uh, much maligned creature. Okay, do I celebrate? It's called Worms, <laughs> and it's about worms. Um, all right, I salute you, nasty worms. You nasty. You slimy, you segmented, you grow back when cut in half. Oh, to be worm, in mud, a living pasta pool, an oasis of fluid squirm, a downtown of wet. Oh, to be worm, to irrigate earth, to fertilize earth, to fish for fish, to worm for worms. Worm, you nasty. Worm, you slimy. Worm, they say that every time they touch you. But you'll grow back, and one day, They'll need you again. Right. So I got this next one. It's called Ode to My Hands. I got it from Ross Gay, who wrote a poem that was just titled Feet. And uh, it, was, it was started out about feet, and then it ended up being about something else, uh, which is somewhat, somewhat what this poem does, just less successfully. Um, let's see. All right. I mean, I like it, but I mean, Rocky is really good. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's more successful. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Until I get a tenure track position in the top ten creative writing MFA program. Um, Where's Morgan? Indiana, yeah. Bloomington. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, I heard about that. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, oh yeah, this guy's from Bloomington. Hey, Michael. All right, well, went to Blo went to anyway. Um, it's called Ode to My Hands. Um, all right. I suppose I have to talk about them now. When my preference is to feel with my left index and thumb the sore segments of my poor lumpy digits, to feel each knuckle from the side slump to the next, and to flex them all interlocked and amplify their ache, or to clap the fat palm pads around a pocket of air, a flesh thud made for the heck of it, or the way I imagine a broken nose at the end of this bundled knuckle stub in the wrong moment, if the, mo if the wrong moment were to beckon, or the right moment, where, in an unlikely turn of events, my fingers find themselves tangled in a coterie of finer ones, and gently ring them with longing, and move then to a waist, an armful of her hair. This probably is about her, dressed up as a celebration of touch, but as long as we're talking about my hands, friends, know that mine are grisly, hairy from the wrist to the tip, wide enough to cradle a wallet on the backhand, know that they obsess and know that they obsess and overwash themselves to a pale exoskeleton, that there are warts undergoing demolition, and the claws sometimes resemble claws, that the right thumb scar has no memory to account for it, that every time they get a high five, they want to hold on longer. Mm. A little backstory on this one, um, you know, like a, like every, like a lot of people, I have my you know painfully shy uh, story about being painfully shy in high school, or like painfully just awkward in high school, 
and then finding you know finding something that I was good at or you know, like um, that happened to be writing, but specifically uh, puns. Um, <laughs> Oh my dad uh, right over there, is a pun master, sort of, um, I, I, you know, he, he grew me up in his school of, Shogun school of puns, and uh, I uh, tried to, I, I tried, in, in high school I decided that, okay, this is what I got, I might as well, uh, I might as well use it, so, and then I think, I remember That's when I was true. in Jeff Cass's class once, he said something about, like, a book or a novel, and it's just a terrible pun, but I raised my hand and I said, well, that's a novel idea, and then, uh, yeah, I know. You, can, you can, it's all right. <laughs> but he said, uh, he said, I like that, and I said, okay, and things continued from there. Uh, all right. Tony, so, uh, Tony made it onto the, at 2008 Ann Arbor Youth Slam team with this poem. Oh, yeah, I remember writing it like a week or two before the slams. And I remember when I got the idea, I just sort of started, like, I fell on the ground and just giggled for a long time because I, I thought, like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> this, is my, this is my message to the world. All right. It's the Do best it. poem ever written. I I, 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 well, okay. Let's just, okay. All right. This is called The Pundit. I am the pundit. I speak for the puns. I speak for the puns, for the puns have no tongues. I speak for the puns, the puns in all places, the ones in your pea soup that pissed off the neighbors. They live in your garden, you're planting their capers. For sure they have life and get carbon dated. Go to carbon proms, get carbon exhausted and wasted. You get no science. To... Too often, but too often they are hated. But there is a pun in everything. They're even in our blood, so no wonder they get under our skin sometimes. But take heart, for you, for me, for your artichoke dip, for puns can do more than you think. Call them cheesy, they will say, I am Gouda. Call them corny, they will say, I am amazing. Call them bad, they will say, not bad meaning bad, but bad meaning Gouda. I am the pundit, I speak for the puns, I speak for the puns, for the puns have no tongues. Those who get kicks out of shopping for shoes, those flipping out when their cell phone is used. It's an old poem. <laughs> those who view wars as a bomb in nations. Those who hit hard and cover all bases. Did you catch that last one? And yes, you will hear the same ones played over and over. I'm sure if any of you are anything like me, you will be thinking now, this is really funny. Uh, yeah. oh, no, no, it's not over. It's not over. Please, please don't let it out on that, God. Okay, please, God. Um, uh, it, it's not funny. I'm sorry. All right. Or, or maybe you will be thinking of you and your bike and how you were both too tired to ride. Maybe that joke is wheelie outdated. Maybe I never should have spoke in my attempt to pedal it. But I speak for all puns. Every pun, everything has its own backdrop because in everything we are all searching for a double meaning. You see, how can we be real without something fishy tangled in our nets? Did you like that line? <laughs> Did it hook you? Everything has a thousand billion names, all the same names if you see everybody as a rearrangement of truths of swings, of bark, of roaches, of bullets, of letters, of letters. What is a body? What is a name if not sh a shot in the dark and everything else? Do you know me, St. Anthony? I was, I'm named after you. Do you know me, Little Goat? That's perhaps what my last name means in German. We haven't figured it out. We can always translate ourselves into something else, like say a bear, if your outlook is grisly. A marker, so you can be the highlight of someone's day. The leader of an anti-smoking campaign if you just want to beat the tar out of somebody. And something else and again, and puns have a thousand billion names because you can link any anything thing to any any no oh wait, I missed that. Any anything thing to any anything thing else else. And we have a thousand billion names. Do you know me? So Classic. 
Yeah. How have I never heard that? That's a piece of Ann Arbor history right there. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I've never heard that. What are we looking at here? Okay. Another, uh, I've always, you know, like when you're at like a, like a sporting event, like, you know, it's a good, like Michigan football game or whatever, like there's a big crowd and like you're like supported and they're cheering, all, all cheering at once and you're supported by this volume. And then, and then it just suddenly dies down, and then I, you have this existential crisis where everything's just like, that's how what I wrote this poem about. Maybe it's just me. Uh, how crowds. All right. When cheers in the bleachers die, the four walls of sound collapsed and broken into bits. We find ourselves falling in place. We find ourselves in the middle of the air with planted feet. For a moment, the eyes of my ears blink at the sudden nothing. For a moment, the tongues of my ears are dry and alone with a thousand bodies. Okay. Uh, okay, this poem's called Linda. Um, a lot of the, a lot of this poem was written just thinking about my old neighbor Jerry, Jerry White. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly written in his, pers it's not written in his perspective necessarily, but kind of like just thinking about him. Um, he passed away. He's a, he's a good neighbor of mine. I broke a couple of, I broke a window of his once accidentally, but he was nice about it. I also broke, I also broke a zip line that he made for his kids because I was a little bit too bad for it. I think I broke that. Too. <laughs> Good name. Um, <clears throat> all right, it's called Linda. Um, I let the leaves steep while I wrap my hand around a stress ball and squeeze. No more waiting home in the damn flood buckets of rain, the trees hanging on in the wind at a slant. Tomorrow I'll probably find debris blocking my fucking driveway again, the thick limbs stuck in the eaves. I used to drag those branches off my drive and call the city truck. I'd help heave them back and wave to the men good luck. I used to cover the gutters with wire, mesh to keep them clean and fall. And sometimes she would come out to see me on my ladder, just to smile. And I'd joke, I won't always be this tall. What do, how much how much time do you think? You're at have? 18 minutes right now. I don't ooh, know. Ooh, 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 this okay. guy's been recording. Okay. Two, three. I'll have you for another 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> don't take it seriously. Uh, here we go. Prayer after wasting an hour by driving to Chick fil A. Briefly featuring my younger sister right there. Teresa, I love you. You're great. Um, she's graduating with her degree in clarinet performance and, edu and music education. So I'm just going to clap. Um, and then possibly we'll get a good master's degree. All right. All right, it's called Prayer, Prayer After Wasting an Hour by Driving to Chick-fil-A. Uh, okay, this is in the Bowling Green, Toledo area. In a split second move while ex exiting Costco, I veer to the right instead of the left, setting the course for Chick-fil-A, home of the original chicken sandwich, which, when mentioned to my little sister, bugs out her eyes and points them to the nearest store no matter the miles or state boundary lines. And really, everybody's been there once, so I'm told, I'm told, so why not drive 15 minutes out of the way in the name of the necessity of lunch? Even though my plan for the day was to visit the counseling center's walk-in hours and fill out paperwork before meeting with a counselor to discuss certain issues that remain nameless for the simple fact that their elusiveness is legendary in my personal mythology, so much so that to say I have a problem is to say I have another two years until it becomes visible enough to really understand what it might be. But at least I got my glasses bent back into shape in a cheap tank cheap half tank of gas at Costco, and the chicken sandwich isn't bad, and now I can say that I've been there to my little sister. She'll be happy about that. 
and I'll be happy about the way I, no doubt, assisted by the meds, can say, okay, all right, thanks, God. Where to next? fan of the Toledo Zoo. I have a year-round membership for the second year in a row. Also, I can take one person for free with me every time I go. So, I mean, I'm not just asking strangers to go to the zoo with me. I'm just saying, like, if you wanted to go to the zoo and you know me, this might work out. Um, I really like the zoo. I've been there probably like 30 sometimes in the last two years. Don't judge me. I don't want to be like a crazy zoo person, but I'm just putting that out there and being vulnerable. All right. Uh, this is from Future Roma. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I didn't watch Future Roma. That's okay. <laughs> See a couple episodes. It's pretty good. Um, <clears throat> all right. Yeah, well, thanks for being here, by the way. I'm really happy to see you all. And, you know, you guys are a great audience. I love poetry. And I, love, I love hanging out with people who love poetry, too. So, awesome. All right, this is called Talking to Animals. If I didn't sound like a weirdo anyway. Um, the squirrels are reassuring when they stand and stare at me, a still stranger, a statue man, an approximate form of a previous meal feeder. They delight me when they dig for acorns, arm twigs flicking off pebbles and dirt clods, or their tails when they run away at my slightest twitch, those fluffy banners that trail behind them like jangles tied to a nuptial station wagon. Don't leave me, squirrel, I want to say, or actually do say, I love you, you make me happy. If other people are near, I stick to civilities. How are you, squirrel? You look great. At the Toledo Zoo, I press my nose against the glass where the, ry where the rhinos make their winter home, and I watch one of them chew with his wet, drooled smackers. A massive maw full of foliage. Look at him, chew, I say. Ooh, look at him. And I oblige, moving to his magnificent horn, big as a bucket, constructed of tiny compressed hairs, millions of them. Look at that horn, I say. When he boulders slow to the glass and taps his horn against my nose, opens his left eye to mine, I may only be able to say, wow. But it's a big wow, a whopper wow. So many moments compressed inside of it, millions of them. When a hippopotamus is hungry at the, at, a near, at the near empty zoo, he makes a noise that pierces through thick glass and brick and finds me 50 yards out, baffled at who or what could produce it. A baby with an amp and an unclean spirit inside? A chicken fighting for life in the throat of a lion? When I trace it to the hippoquarium, hippoquarium, by the way, this is what they call it, and see the and see the evil music synchronize with his open mouth, I'm still a skeptic. So I ask the hippo himself, "Is that you? Should I call an ambulance?" I imagine, right or wrong, this hippo squeals as he does in his cramped tank beneath the zookeeper's window because he used he's used to human hands reaching out with grass and he needs some way to let them know. And as long as I'm imagining things, I talk to animals because I'm hungry for them to feed my spirit, and I want them to let, and I want to let them know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, what are we looking at here? Um, okay, I'm gonna read this one. Uh, this is very near and dear to me. Um, you know those moments like sometimes like uh, when uh, when a parent or a loved one like puts a puts like a blanket on you when you're sleeping I, that's always like been the epitome of love for me just like I just I just always thought it was just like oh that's, that's really nice um, and you know this is called uh, <clears throat> when my mom for the millionth time puts an extra blanket on me at four four o'clock a.m. Um, there's like some dream sequence in here, so just in case you don't catch it, just to let me know. Okay. It's pretty obvious, but it's also weird. Um, I imagine I dreamt toward morning that a deep-bellied canoe big enough to carry my whole pyramid of needs swaddled me 
up and out of my leaky paper skiff. Then I rolled into its arched hull and made it sway with my shivery shoulder. Then I lay there chatting up pretty girls in their immaculate sailboats. Then I peeked up at the sky full of eggs, fried over easy and dripping butter down. Um, well, no, I'm going to do this one. Okay. Uh, just quick story. I uh, went to WCC for my first two years, and I was in woo! jazz. Yeah, woo! Yeah, okay, yeah. Johnny Wolfpack, Wolfpack. I found it. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? The Wolfpack. Um, uh, they even uh, got a dude with a wolf costume for the talent show. Oh, man. Yeah. I didn't know that, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet that dude. Um, okay, so uh, I was in jazz orchestra once. Well, jazz band combo, combo one semester, and the teacher of the combo was also the teacher of the jazz orchestra, Johnny Lawrence. Johnny Lawrence. Johnny Lawrence. Awesome dude. Yeah, such a, like such a great guy. Such a great guy. Such a wonderful musician. Give me that bottom. Give me I, that. What, that I, I played bass in his class, and he was always like, give me that bottom, and give I was always cracking bottom. up. Yeah. Want that bottom. That, well, he did. <laughs> um, I mean, he's being real. <laughs> One of my favorite thing. teachers of all time. He's great. Um, and uh, but so one day he just so the jazz, jazz orchestra was going to w, to uh, Wash, Washington D.C. to perform at the you know the White House Christmas tree. They have performers like for a month, you know, like performing at, at different times at the Christmas tree. And we had, uh, WCC Jazz Orchestra was going there. And uh, one day, you know, Johnny Lawrence he comes up to me and says, "Okay, you got everything packed? You all ready for the trip?" I said, no, I'm, I'm not in the orchestra, I'm in the combo. And he said, oh. And then like, later he comes up to me and said, I feel so bad, there's someone who looks exactly like you in the jazz orchestra. <laughs> and, I thought he, and I thought he was you the whole semester. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what? I thought he was you the whole semester, a guy oh. named Joe Gates, uh, he's a cool dude. I was you the whole semester, and then because he felt so bad, he let me come to DC with him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, for, for free. Um, but anyway, okay, so this is and this was not the best. It wasn't the best time of my life. I mean, I I probably laughed then, and I can laugh now. But other things were like it wasn't the best. Yeah. You know, okay, so it's called <clears throat> Alone in January at 9 p.m. in the DC Holiday Inn restaurant and bar. I order the triple scoop, draped in peaches, and try my second generation gilt Spanish with a Salvadorian waiter whose smile fortunately does not flinch when I run out of flashcard phrases, unlike the lady back home at the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, whose grave expression and my lack of fluency forever colors my, achievement, my achievements in English poetry, a fresh coat of office tope. It could be worse than being in this city, with a mediocre community college band that invited me because the director for a whole semester mistook me, a trumpet player in one of the combos, for his big band baritone, and then felt bad when he realized. John Lawrence is great, I'm just saying. <laughs> I eat all three scoops slowly, never taking eyes away, never letting the peach scent leave my nose or the cream melt anywhere but behind my teeth. And like those athletes who lose all sound in the heat of their craft, I only hear the sound of milk fill me a momentary fullness. What are you doing on time, man? Yeah, 29 minutes. That, that, what? Hey, okay. we're going for half an hour. I'm sorry. I'm you good? Sorry. Give me two yeah, more. Two more? I can do two more. Let me just, uh, so these two. features are too short anyway. They are, well, honestly. You know, like they, it happens. Yeah, you can have the time. <laughs> and, uh, okay, two more. Okay, here we go. This is called Oh, to be less, even less responsible. I wrote this as a grad student, and I was just like living, for, living on my own, really, for the first time. And I'm, all, I'm all over the place. Oh, to be even less responsible. Fly out of the apartment and leave the door unlocked. Glory in the little blue slice in the sky or the fall-stripped tree looking like a circuit of veins planted there by Michael and Ann Winter, class of 1985. Even for the lead gray morning with little pricks of rain and the sight of an orange dumpster with black doors or a door without a doorknob, 
Even for those when I drop this pseudo schedule of jogging through the classroom door, five minutes late on the dot, eating plain noodles with hamburger three days straight, using swim trunks as underwear before doing the laundry, <laughs> of scheduling therapist sessions and sleeping through them entirely, oh, to leave my wallet and keys in the car so it can leave and return with groceries that leap out of the trunk and skip themselves <laughs> through my propped, op propped apartment door, oh, that my poems might find a pen and a scrap of paper without my knowing it, obedient little ones as they are. Okay, here we go. What are we doing here? Um, I want, aha! Here we go. This one. Um, all right. It's called Running Places. Um, okay. Anyway, the private loan sharks have been ringing my cell for quite some time, not to say that they don't have the legal right, but just to say that I wish them generations of awful children born to a soundtrack of garbage truck hydraulics. And may they depend on the generosity of a Monsanto lawyer to procure their toilet paper and soap. Though certainly that may be a worse fate. But in the meantime, I would like to call this audience to order for ordering my book. How could you be so careless and lacking in sense? It's a simple question for you elegant persons. Why would you, what would possess you to swim this unpremeditated stream with me? What brand of psychopharmacology does your hypnotist rebuke? Besides, I don't even have a book. So you must be dreaming inside of a dream inside, so you must be dreaming inside of my dream, inside of a one bedroom apartment with the brown recluse spiders and dirty laundry sculpture gardens. But the moral of this story has been postponed too long already. And the lone sharks swim in my little stream, and when I kick away and away from them, they get closer and closer. It becomes clearer and clearer that their teeth are plated in gold, and their eyes are emeralds, and their laughs are gargles full of dolphin innards, and the little fish that clean their backs are so full of bacteria, they need their own little fish, and everyone is a little fish, and I can't think of anything more terrible or elegant than that. So that's it. I love you guys. You guys are great. And uh, thank you so much. Give, it, give uh, Ann Arbor Poetry a, a hand <laughs> okay. for all the good work they do. Right. Here every month, twice a month, twice a month. Bring, yes. in, bring in the word. So, man, I hope to see you, I hope to see you next time. All right. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs>